Good evening, everyone. I hope you're having a good one. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the murder of Kimberly Gale Womack. We're going to be talking with her daughter. The police told her in 2008 that her mom had been alone in the nude, slipped on chocolate syrup, hit herself in the head, and died. And then shortly after the memorial service, they said, you know what? We might have made a mistake, and I know we, that you just cremated your mom, but as it turns out, we think she may have been murdered. And here's the good thing, though. The married sheriff's deputy she was dating had nothing to do with it. So everyone, I met Catherine, I guess it's uh, been three or four years ago, right before COVID, uh, same situation. I was interviewing her for a podcast and the COVID kind of slowed down everything that we had going on. So I, I felt like I owed it to her to catch up and find out what's going on. But the other thing, in, in the years that have passed, Catherine has done some remarkable work helping victims of crimes, not just victims, but the families of victims of crime, not to make the mistakes she did dealing with sheriff's offices and DAs and that sort of thing. So it's just remarkable the work that Catherine has done. And we're going to spend some time talking to her about that. But first, we're going to take a look at the situation regarding her mom. And it's just it's just a tragic, terrible situation, to be honest with you. Catherine, can you hear me? I sure can. Well, good. Welcome to the show. I appreciate you joining us tonight. I, I wanted to start uh, not talking about uh, necessarily about the murder, but talking initially about your mom's life. Now, she was born in Magnolia, Mississippi. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Back in 1959. And her dad, I think, was originally from Kentwood. So they moved to Kentwood, and that's that's where she grew up. And then ultimately, she died in Point Capi Parish. Can you kind of fill in the gaps of her life in between those points? Sure, I, I sure can. So I believe my mom had her childhood in Kentwood, Louisiana. She was one of three daughters. Um, she has two sisters, um, both younger than her, mm -hmm. my Aunt Frida and my Aunt Darla. And when my mom was about, I don't know, I think around 11, somewhere around 10, give or take a couple of years, they moved to Baton Rouge, pretty much. Um, okay. And she finished out the remainder of her childhood there. Um, she had me when she was young, somewhere around the age of 20, again, give or take a couple of years. <laughs> um, and she and my dad divorced when I was an infant. And uh, I grew up going to see her. She worked in the plants, so I would mm -hmm. go and see her in intervals. Um, she was a safety tech in the plants, and then she was an EMT on the ambulance. Mm -hmm. So she spent the majority of her adult life as a caretaker, as really taking care of other people and tending to the needs of other people. Mm -hmm. And that included me without a doubt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so that was a big part of her personality. And then just something that I have to mention was her sense of humor. She was always laughing at something. And now that I'm an adult, I recognize that I inherited her sense of humor. It's always something to laugh at, always something to find the joy in, and she, she was definitely that way. She was, um, a loud personality mm -hmm. and, uh, up until, up until the time that she died, she was a lot of fun and, uh, either making us all laugh or driving us all crazy. One of the two. <laughs> wow. So how did she end up in Point Capi? So, um, she started to date a man that had a camp out in Point Capi, mm -hmm. and she moved in with him, and their relationship ended, but it was very amicable. They remained on good terms. They remained friends, 
And so when she moved out of his camp, she found a place right nearby mm -hmm. um, on the island side of False River in Jaro. And she moved in there and she loved it out there on the river. She loved her neighbors. Um, she loved the people that she knew. She was tending to people out there, stitching up fish hook wounds and mm -hmm. um, sitting with her neighbor's elderly parents. And um, she, she really fit in well out there. Wow. Yeah, I know when the uh, sheriff's office came to investigate, it was because the neighbors got concerned when they hadn't heard from her. So she must have been close. Yes, she was very close with not everyone she met. Mm -hmm. You know, she had a tight circle of friends, but she was friends with everyone. She didn't have any enemies. So, right, the her landlords, actually, who lived on the property, mm -hmm. the same property, had not seen her in several days, and they knew that was unusual. They typically saw her coming and going every day. And so they went to check on her, and they were the ones who um, discovered her deceased in her home. Wow. And after that, the did the coroner's office came out, or did it start with the sheriff's office? You know, I'm, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. because none of my—I was not there. I was on a road trip, and— my ex my family, her sisters, um, one lives in Texas, and then the one who lived here mm -hmm. did not make it to the scene. Um, the way we got informed was her former boyfriend, who still lived out there, mm -hmm. um, he was at work in Baton Rouge, but some of the neighbors called him and said, there are a lot of police units, and it looks like they're at Kim's house. And he alerted my aunt and then he called back a little bit later and said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've heard that the, it, it's confirmed they mm -hmm. are at Kim's house. Oh, and wow. my aunt drove straight to the Point Capi Sheriff's Department. I think they may have called her at some point, but um, that's that's how we got the news. And I'm not sure who who arrived on scene first. Okay. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but how old were you at that time, Catherine? About? I was 29. Okay, 29. So quite a shock. Had you, do you did you see your mom regularly during that time or? Yes. Um, okay. I had seen her all summer. We had had a great summer. Um, my aunt that lives here or well lives in Baton Rouge, close to Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. has a big pool in her backyard, and so all of my cousins and friends, we spent the summer out there, um, and my mom was with us. Um, she would bring these, uh, you know, pool, pool toys and these plastic blow up floats. <laughs> and, um, you know, we had a great time that summer. The summer was coming to an end and we had all kind of sort of gone back to our regular lives, um, mm -hmm. getting the kids registered for school, buying uniforms, all that sort of thing. So it had been maybe a couple of weeks since I had talked to my mom. Okay. I actually don't remember um, the last time that I spoke to her because, you know, it had been a little while and mm -hmm. it's not something that I was taking note of at the time. Right. Uh, well, we've got, uh, I've got a couple of photos here. I'm going to show, uh, one, of course, I, I mean, these, these are photos that we've seen everywhere. One is your mom, uh, by herself. And then one is with the two of you together. And then yeah. the third one, I believe is with your son. Right. Can you tell me about how long uh, that was before she passed? Braxton had to be, uh, he was about five or six years old, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit younger. Four. He was four. He was four years old. Um, she loved Braxton. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just took such delight in him. When I um, conceived Braxton, she hurried to be the first to buy a baby toy. Oh. Um, she just got the biggest kick out of him and he loved her. She was, she was fun. She mm -hmm. was a great deal of fun. So at that time, how many uh, children did you have? Just him. Just him. Did they do much together then? Did she take him places or? Oh, yes. But our mm -hmm. main, um, gathering spot was my aunt's house because mm -hmm. she had a nice big house with a pool and a lot of property. Um, she had a pond in the back which is where we eventually ended up spreading my mom's ashes. But um, 
you know, my son would go out there and play with his uncle and my mom and my aunt. And Mm -hmm. that was our gathering spot where we always had family over and spent time together. And there was just so much to do there on that property. So they had a, they had a great time together. What happened after you got the call about your mom? So when we first got word that my mom had died, mm-hmm. we no one thought homicide. No one. Um, I certainly did not. You know, when my aunt met with me and told me, we got a phone call and your mom has passed away. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a shock and it was a very weird experience. I kept waiting for it to hit me and it just, it wouldn't hit me. Mm -hmm. And it was looking back on it now, it was almost as though I knew there was more to come and I needed to wait for that. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it, it was a very odd experience. It just, it wouldn't hit me. And I stayed in a state of, um, where I, I had stopped. Mm -hmm. I I had just stopped and I was waiting and, and like time wasn't moving. It it was a very bizarre, very difficult thing to describe. So that was a Friday when we got word that she had been found in our home. Mm -hmm. Um, on Saturday, my two aunts went out to her house and they were, um, you know, take getting some of her belongings and the things that you do. Mm-hmm. And we knew the police had told us that on Sunday, the autopsy was taking place. On Monday, the Point Capi Sheriff's Department called my two aunts and I into the office. Mm-hmm. And um, they were giving us the results of the autopsy and telling us it was the first official meeting that we had with them and they sat us down in a room there were three detectives in there and at 29 years old I had no experience with law enforcement um or you know um prosecution I I was completely naive Mm -hmm. so my aunts and I sat down and they told us you know your mom was preparing ice cream and she spilled chocolate syrup on the floor Mm -hmm. slipped on it, and hit her head and that made her woozy and she stumbled to her back bedroom and laid down and succumbed to her head injury and they showed us a toxicology report and I think the first red flag for me besides the bizarre story Mm -hmm. The first red flag for me was that so much of the toxicology report was blacked out and big black marker. And, you know, what reason is there to black something out if if there's nothing to hide? There were three medications in her system um, and they were telling us these medications contributed to her being in a state that was susceptible to becoming woozy. Hmm. But the medications were Celexa, which is uh, your basic antidepressant, like Prozac, Paxil, uh, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Um, Another one was Darvaset, which is not even made anymore. It was very ineffective. It was um, like a baby pain pill. It was like a high dose of Tylenol. Um, And then the third medication was a caffeine pill, which is a little bit the opposite of, you know, making you woozy. So. I had red flags going up, but I was so trusting of the police and the story they were telling me that I didn't know it, but I was experiencing severe cognitive dissonance. Mm. Like, this sounds crazy, but I believe you, but something's wrong. It, it, it was just, it was bizarre. And, yeah, the and you're ne- dealing with professionals, they should know, right? Right. And what reason would they have? to make up a crazy story. Mm -hmm. So we left there, my aunts and I, believing the story, but something had 
changed inside of me and I didn't quite recognize it yet. I started to keep my eyes and ears open and I didn't quite know why I was doing it. I had my eyes on my mom's ex-boyfriend. He was at our house, you know, cooking with us and grieving with us. And I was listening to every word that he said, every, any man that was around, Mm -hmm. I was making note of the way they, their, their facial expression, the tone of their voice, what they said, I was recording mentally recording everything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't quite know why I was in a heightened state. And we had her memorial service on, I think it was the Tuesday or the Wednesday, the next day or the day after she was cremated quickly. Um, those were her wishes were to be cremated. And, um, I noticed that the man that she was currently dating did not attend. Mm -hmm. And this man was someone that I had known for my entire life. Um, My mom had a long history with him. They had dated when I was very young um, and they remained friends. Uh, When I was in high school, uh, he quote unquote fixed a couple of tickets for me. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I knew this man rather well and prior he was a sheriff's deputy yes he was a sheriff's deputy and i'm sorry he was a city police officer in baton rouge okay and then he got moved to west baton rouge parish sheriff's department where he was a detective at the time that my mom died and she had told us all that they were dating again Mm -hmm. and you know we knew this and so when he did not show up for the memorial We all began to ask each other, has he called you? Has he called you? And we realized that he was nowhere to be found. And we found that extremely odd. And I, with all the other red flags, realized, okay, this isn't right. And I called the coroner. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, did she suffer? Tell me what happened. Um, I need to know what my mom experienced. And the coroner told me after the blows to her head, death would have been immediate. So she didn't suffer. Wow. But he said blows plural. Mm -hmm. And he said death would have been immediate. So she would not have been able to make her way down to the bedroom to lie down and succumb to her injuries. Okay. And he further, he went on to further explain to me that someone had come to him. I don't know if it was. I don't know who it was, what Mm -hmm. agency they were with. Someone had come to him and tried to, quote, strong arm him into changing his findings from homicide to accident. But he refused to. And that let me know. Good for him. Good for him. Right. That entire department Mm -hmm. is the reason I know what happened, a little bit of what happened to my mom. They treated my family and I with dignity, with respect. That the coroner's department in Point Capi were wonderful to my family and I. They told us the truth, and I have all the gratitude in the world for them. (laughs) That's Um, great. I've got some some names here. Let me find them real quick here. Uh, So Dr. Alfredo Suarez performed the autopsy? Oh, well, yes. I believe – I'm not clear on that. I'm not clear on who performed the autopsy, but it was Dr. Kellerman, Mm -hmm. the coroner, who showed up on scene – and yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, because Suarez had signed off on it, but all the notes you write are from Harry Kellerman. Correct. And, and he, he notes uh, multiple fractured ribs, multiple bruises in her upper and lower extremities, as well as mid frontal region of the face. Uh, right. And also had said blood was coming from her oral cavity from and both nostrils. So that that was all. We know that because of his his diligent work. And the other person involved was Deputy Coroner Dr. Ty Cheney. Right. He's a deputy coroner. He's not not a doctor, but he mm-hmm. has been amazing again to me and my family. Um Good. they she did have significant injuries on the front, back, both sides, top, bottom, all over. Um mm. the most significant injury was on her forehead. It looks like um, it looks like a like a hatchet wound. Mm-hmm. Her forehead is split open down to the bone. Oh wow! And that blow ostensibly is what caused her brain to hit the back of her skull, and that sub 
that caused a subdural hematoma, mm -hmm. and that is what killed her. But she also had a blow to the left side of her skull. Mm. All, all of her ribs were broken, and she had a punctured lung, and that lung collapsed. She had strike marks on her back that were skipped. They, they were in a, in a pattern that was unique, and I still don't know wow. what that was from. She had. It's one thing for certain. All of that didn't come from a fall. That's right. That's right. It certainly did not. Um, it certainly did not. There is no way that she mm -hmm. uh, inflicted all of those injuries to herself. I mean, broken ribs, a punctured lung, the split on the forehead, all the cuts on her elbows and her knees. There's just no way she would have had to put herself through a rock tumbler. Uh, there's just wow. no way. And, you know, the police knew that when they told us it was an accident. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I guess it just is what it is. But after I spoke to the coroner, it was only a day or two after when the sheriff's department called me directly and asked me to come in to the office again. Mm -hmm. And now that I know it's a homicide, I think they're calling me to tell me who did it. Yeah, I mean, now, where, were you, where were you living at the time, Catherine? Baton Rouge. And they were um, calling you to point compete. Right. Right. And again, I'm 29 years old. All I know is what I've seen on TV and mm -hmm. on TV, people get killed and then someone else is arrested. And oh, yeah. so CSI. <laughs> I did right. So the whole way there, I think they're about to tell me who killed my mom. They're, that's what they've called me in for. They're about to tell me oh, who killed my mom. And I was just breathless the whole drive there mm -hmm. thinking, who could it be? Who could it be? Just going over in my mind. And I got there and they just wanted to tell me that they had declared it a homicide, which I already knew. Right. And they were not happy that I already knew. Um, but that was it. That was all they wanted to tell me. And, um, you know, we talked about a few of the people who were around her. Uh, but that was it. It was a very short meeting. Um, nothing much came out of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I went back home and I, I still had... I still had hopes that something was going to happen. I knew the police had lied, but I still was trying to make it fit. I still thought, well, maybe it was an investigative tool. Maybe this, maybe that. Mm -hmm. um, despite the fact that, you know, my mom is dating a police officer who's not showed up and the police have lied. I mean, the, the obviousness of it was staring me in the face. But to wrap your mind around something like that, not only something like that, but something like that happening to you. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit. Yeah. Um, so when when it had all finally sunk in, mm -hmm. uh, I remembered ADA Tony Clayton. Um, he he made a name for himself off of the back of the Derek Todd Lee case, um, and I remembered that name. And so I thought maybe he'll care. And I called him up. And this is the, the 18th Judicial District. He was the DA, right? Correct, yes. Okay. West Baton Rouge, Iberville, Point Capi. Gotcha. So I called him just kind of out of the blue. I didn't, you know, ask. I, I didn't make any preparation or ask You've never anybody. met him before? Nothing right. like that? Mm -hmm. And I didn't think he would even know about my mom's passing uh, or about her murder. I just... I thought I was going to be informing him about something. And right. I was shocked when he said he was very belligerent right off the bat. Ooh. And he said, I do know about this case and the police didn't lie. I'm the one who told them to call it an accident. And he said, you're a conspiracy theorist. There's nothing weird going on. Your mom died due to the way she lived her life. Oh, my God. And we we ended up screaming at each other. Yeah. And. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, right. It it was I was shocked. Mm -hmm. It I was it was like it was like someone cracked a whip when you're not expecting it. It was just such a shock and and wow. it stung. And I uh you know, I asked him where he got his MD to to be making medical calls. <laughs> um, and he insulted me back and we hung up on each other. I don't, I don't honestly remember who hung up first, but right. I snapped in that moment. Um, 
you know, the, all of it was building up and I just finally snapped. I had gone on the internet prior to that phone call mm-hmm. looking for the man that she was dating. And I had discovered that he was married. We didn't know that before. Um, okay. And I discovered that his wife was a private investigator and I got what I thought was the address to her office hmm. on the internet. And I, when I hung up with Tony Clayton, I was in, I was in a state. I can imagine. I was, it, yes. It's just indescribable. Hmm. So I got in my car and drove to. Hey, so Catherine, wh- what about your siblings? Were they not involved at this time? My mom, I was her only child. Okay, great job. I should have asked that early on. And the rest of the family, anybody else close to you guys? Uh, yes, my mom's two sisters. One of them did not live here. So she was here helping with, you know, the funeral arrangements mm-hmm. and all of those sorts of things. But then she had to go back home. And so she was as involved as she could have been. Sure. Um. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, that's okay. <laughs> um. So I'm having my you know, momentary lapse of sanity. Mm -hmm. And I drove to the office of the wife of my mom's boyfriend. Oh, wow. And it turned out to be their home. She Mm -hmm. ran her office out of their home. And I sat down with her and put my mom's picture in front of her. And I said, do you know this woman? And of course, I'm watching her now because she's a private investigator. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking the obvious. Did she find out? Did she go kill my mom? And Wow. Um, I, she, uh, allayed that suspicion in me because she got very hung up on me proving the affair first. And so that made me believe that she did not have any prior knowledge and that, you know, she could be crossed off the suspect list. Okay. So she was very uh, trusting of her spouse. She was, but she, she kept receipts. She, she was able to look back on credit card statements and I was able to prove the involvement with my mom to her okay. through records that she had kept. So, um, she's a smart woman. She's, hmm. she may have been trusting, but she was, she was smart. She was a private investigator. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Um, wow. so she said, we're going to fill out paperwork as though you have hired me to investigate your mom's case. Uh-huh. And when my husband gets home. I'm going to present him with this paperwork and ask him if he knows anything about this case. <laughs> and I thought that was great. This is a good plan. Yep. So um, I did that. And of course, I couldn't sleep that night. I couldn't wait to talk to her again. Mm-hmm. And I called her the next morning and she sounded shaken up, which any woman would be no matter the circumstance. Um, but she said and she sounded. She sounded solemn. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can't talk to you anymore, but best of luck to you. And of course, I was disappointed. You know, I was hoping, I was hoping for a partner and investigating, you know, um, but I, of course you understand at the same time. Um, So that was the last time I spoke to her and the police department put out other suspects and, you know, on the radar And I went and visited every single one of them. Um, I I wanted to look them in the face. I wanted to read their tone of voice. I wanted to see how they would look at me, if they would make eye contact with me. Now, how did that happen, Catherine? How did the police give you these names? Not directly, I I, guess. Yes, absolutely. I began to meet with one of the detectives regularly. I I talked to him every single week. Um, Mm -hmm. it It was never a thought that this crime would go unsolved ever. Mm -hmm. It it was, we're going to figure this out. And I I was speaking to him regularly. Um, You know, so I would go and visit these, these suspects and he knew it wasn't as though I was doing it without his knowledge or permission. Um, And just nothing ever came of it. It just sort of fizzled out. And, Wow. After about a year, I, I sort of had to go back. I had to take care of myself. Sure. Um, and I just waited. I, you know, it. 11 years passed where my family and I thought maybe someday, mm-hmm. maybe someone will talk. You know, what, what else can we do? Right. 
And so many people are in that boat today, just waiting. That's the worst part is not knowing. I mean, I can't imagine that knowing would honestly make it any better, but it would put the last piece of the puzzle there. Mm -hmm. At least we would have a complete picture. Yeah. You know, and Catherine, I got to stop for a minute just to, to reiterate this. You know, every week here, I say uh, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows something, which is a little play on the traditional thing. But I, everybody knows you know, for every case out there, somebody knows something about it. And it's just a matter of reaching that person. And, and to me, they, the people that are watching this, our audience is saying, well, so why do I care? Why, why should I pass that on? And, and that's why I like them to hear your story, to understand what you were going through while you're waiting to hear nothing. Right, right. Um, I believe Tom Aswell made a great statement when he said in his article, 11 years is a long time to wait for the phone to ring. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. And uh, it was. It was. So has the phone since rung? Well, sort of. Okay. And at the end of 2019, reporter um, Jim Hummel with KATC and okay. Lafayette got in touch with me. He was doing a story on the illegal cremation of homicide victims. Okay. What I did not know at the time of my mom's cremation was that Louisiana law said if there are any suspicious circumstances or the reasonable probability that a crime has occurred, the coroner shall deny the permit to cremate. We didn't know that. Hmm. So the coroner was sort of our last line of defense in saving my mother's body as evidence, and and he didn't do that. Wow. So Jim Hummel did an amazing piece. He won a John Corbel Award, and he won a local Emmy for the expose. I that didn't he did. know that. That's great. He did. He's he did an amazing job um, researching and bringing out information about each and every parish and even other states. He he did a really great job. After cool. that, other people began to pick up my mom's story. Mm -hmm. You were one of them, right? Um, Tom Aswell with Louisiana Voice did an article. You did an article, and after your article came out, the phone rang, and it was Tony Clayton. Oh, wow. And I will certainly never forget that moment when I looked at my phone and the caller ID was scrolling district attorney Antonio Clayton. Uh -huh. And I was ready because, believe me, I had been thinking about him for those 11 years. Yeah. I had not forgotten. And I answered the phone and he asked me what it is that I want which I found to be a remarkably stupid question. Wow. What do you think I want? I want to know who killed my mom. I want you to solve this case. That's so he asked, he asked to meet with me, and I didn't want to be tricked again. You know, I had learned a great deal since my mom had died. Mm -hmm. I, I had been exposed to a great deal of what really happens behind the scenes. But still... I'm facing people who know so much more than I do. And I recognize that I don't know enough to go up against these guys. So I hired an attorney to come to the meeting with me. And in that meeting, we made a public records request. The Louisiana law says after 10 years with no prosecution, the investigative file belongs to the next of kin. Okay. So we were, it had been 11 years and we were requesting those public records. Well, Tony Clayton kept saying, you'll have to fight me up to the Supreme Court. Let's go to the Supreme Court. He mentioned the Supreme Court so many times that I knew this was a friendly place for him and not a friendly place for me. It, wow. it was clear. And in the same meeting, he said he wanted prosecutorial immunity, mm -hmm. which, of course, it begs the question, why? Why do you want prosecutorial immunity? Which is, I'm sorry absolute immunity if mm. there's nothing to see here right and um we left that meeting with no agreements 
Uh, so my attorney and I filed a lawsuit against him, against ADA Tony Creighton, mm -hmm. um, for the public records. And he produced them after we filed the lawsuit. He gave us, he handed over a, a CD. And after reviewing this CD, it was very clear that it, it was not the complete records. There are interviews that are referred to that are not in the records. There are polygraphs that are referred to that are not in the records. Okay. It, it was clear that it wasn't complete. Hmm. Um, but it was a lot to go through. Um, a, a lot of information to go over and pour through. And that was the first time I had pictures of the crime scene and mm. pictures of my mom herself. Oh, my God. And, you know, you can describe the injuries, but you see them and it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, oh, that's that's horrible. Anyone mm. who sees those pictures, there's no doubt in their mind. These injuries were not self-inflicted. So I gained the attention of a cold case team, um, the Cold Case Foundation. Okay. They're a nonprofit. And they gained the attention of Sheriff Thibodeau of Point to P Parish Sheriff's Office. Nice. Apartment, or I'm not sure. I forget now. Uh, WBR's office, Sheriff's Office. Um, we had a Zoom meeting with Sheriff Thibodeau, and he said that he would welcome their involvement. And that he would reopen the investigation. Okay. A, a couple of years go by. Mm -hmm. And I grew impatient. And I started to press um, everyone. What is going on? What is happening? And um, I spoke to the, Sar the Sergeant Lambert. He was the detective who was assigned the case. Okay. And then I went on Woody Overton's podcast. And yeah. he put out a call to action for the public to press the sheriff's department for answers. And eventually, I, they, they really did start an investigation. Um, you know, I, I was getting word from within the department from friendly sources that they were witnessing interviews and um, meetings. And eventually, last summer, actually, mm -hmm. maybe in June, maybe in July, Last summer, I got a call, a final call from the sheriff's department. And a couple of things came from that. Um, you know, they closed the investigation with no new information. And, but they explained why. And the original investigation in 2008 was remarkably poor. No one sprayed luminol in the home. No one gusted for fingerprints. No one collected any evidence from the home. Um, the lab tech who clipped my mother's fingernails for DNA did so with her own personal fingernail clippers, oh, wow. thereby contaminating them. The rape kit came back inconclusive. The whole investigation was so lacking. And so there was no evidence. Mm -hmm. The only thing that they had to go on were the photos. That was it. Nothing else. Photos and maybe interviews. And, uh, you know, they made, there was a lot of confusion. Not, I don't want to say confusion. There was much debate over the lack of blood in the photos. They were looking for blood spatter, something okay. that would indicate a fight. And there was a, a good bit of disturbance in my mom's home. There were chairs that were knocked over. There was a plant stand that was knocked over and shattered. There were holes in the wall. There was a bathroom door off the hinges. There were many things that would indicate a fight. But hmm. we don't know if it was like that before. Right. So they were looking for blood spatter. Well, the question I kept asking was, from what injury? The only open wound was on her forehead. That's one hit on her forehead. The subdural hematoma was internal. Her broken ribs were internal. The co collapsed lung was internal. All the bruises wouldn't have bled. Uh, so what, what injury are we expecting to see blood spatter from? Not only that, but the coroner estimated that she had been dead in, at her home for three days before she was found. Oh, Giving wow. anyone plenty of time to come back and clean up the scene. Yeah. 
And again, no one sprayed luminol to see those microscopic blood droplets that wouldn't show up on a photo. So uh, much ado was made about the lack of blood spatter, but there's simply no way on God's green earth that my mom could have sustained all of those injuries by herself. So the case was closed with no, no real resolution. So, and so that's that's where I'm getting lost. So they closed the case. How, how can they do I'm that? Sorry. Right, that was the wrong word to okay, use. Okay, okay. They say that it's still an open investigation, but that doesn't mean that any work is being done on it. Gotcha. It's just not, not closed, right? But it's just not active. Mm. So, you know, I've got 15 years of hindsight now, and. All I know is that my mom was murdered. That's all I know. You know, I don't, I've been through who could have done it. What about this person? What about that person? Was it the obvious person that the police would have wanted to cover for? Right. And I just, I try to keep an open mind. Um, you know, crazy things happen and, and anything is possible. And I just don't know. I can't bring myself to say, I have a suspicion or this is what I think happened. I, I just, there's too many possibilities. And that's just something we're going to have to live with. Yeah, that, that's horrible. It's funny, you, you go back and you, you think about what you were saying about the photographs. If they're that bad, did anybody was who was at that crime scene, anybody investigating that crime scene knew from minute one that it was not an accident? Mm-hmm. So that that screams cover up across the board. Right. And then being lied to. And then, of course, Tony Clayton really lets the cat, of the, cat out of the bag with his own statements mm -hmm. um, saying, you'll have to fight me up to the Supreme Court for records that are legally rightfully yours. Why? Yeah. Why was he so defensive from day one? That That's right. suspicious as well. And in the same meeting, there were detectives from Point Capi there. One of them had been in the room the same day I met with detectives back in 2008. Okay. And one of the questions I had was, why did you lie to us? Why did you say the coroner ruled it an accident when he ruled it a homicide? And that detective said, we don't think you were told that. Hmm. I said, you told my whole family that. Wow. You told everyone that. So all the back and forth, the demanding of prosecutorial immunity or absolute immunity, the denial of the public records, the lying, you know, if it was just a simple, if it was a simple case, they wouldn't have behaved that way. No, not at all. You know, they give themselves away. It's Tony Clayton's mouth that gives them away every time. <laughs> well, you know, that's part of being a politician, I guess. He is a good one. Every politician should take notes from him. Wow. And I heard he was authoring a, a book I, I, somewhere. I don't even know who told me that. So Another one. Oh, he's got one out already. He does. Uh, he has one, maybe two out on the Derek Todd Lee murder. Wow, he really no wonder, yeah. <laughs> so, so where does that leave you, Catherine? So I've had to face the fact that there's nothing I can do. There's nothing within my power mm -hmm. to make, to, to solve this case, to solve my mom's case. And living with that frustration and that feeling of impetus, impotent, impotence mm. is uh, also not within my power. And nothing's in the budget You can try your hardest Can't buy you justice Wanna jump in the truck And go and grab the musket That's what you call Buy you justice